I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be where I am today. When has your life become yours to direct? We're going to get deeper into that in just a minute, but turning your Bibles with me very quickly before we sing that song again. There was a bridge or something that you sang along with that song. What was it? We exalt you. We will exalt the Lord because the Lord says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me. And the Bible says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. And so we will exalt the Lord in here today. John chapter 20, verse 23. So John 20, 23 gives you an insight into the year 2023. Let him who has the heart to receive it, receive of the Lord today this great and marvelous mandate that the Lord brings to us here at Communion House. Justin and Dina, go to see you guys. It's been a minute. God bless you. Thanks for coming out. Now, John 20, 23, what does it say? It says, if you forgive the sins of any. What is the meaning of the word any? It means any. It means anybody. In my mother tongue, the word human is the word any. So when they say any, they're talking about just about any human being. And that is what it means here also. If the Bible says, if you forgive the sins of any, what would happen? The Bible says, they are forgiven. Them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And so if you continue to retain the guilt of your past mistakes, if you continue to retain the regrets of your inaction, guess what? No matter how much God loves you, he cannot forgive you of sins that you have not forgiven yourself of. Jesus says in this manner you shall pray. He says, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. There is a condition to forgiveness because as much as God has willingly forgiven you, by your unforgiveness, you can reverse the forgiveness of God. Jesus told a parable. He said there was a man who owed his master about 10 pieces of silver. I can't remember the exact denomination. About 10 denarii. And the master was like, oh, it's only 10 denarii. Come on, let's, let's just forget about it. It's a bad debt, it's written off. And the same person who was forgiving of 10 denarii, he went to the person that was owing him only one. And he was holding him at the throat, asking. And the master heard about it and he says, did I not forgive you about a hundred? And now this one that is owing you just a, a fraction of what I forgave you, you want him to be cast into prison. Because unforgiveness is like a prison. Because when we hold people in unforgiveness, there is something in our psyche that tells us that we're making their lives difficult. Because of what he did to me, I would not like his post. Now he's gonna suffer a like of post. Because I don't like the way he preaches, I'm not gonna go to that church, so they're gonna suffer and not have me at their church. Because people want to restrict the blessing of God on your life and your liberty by holding you in unforgiveness. But guess what the Bible says? That anybody who tries to put his neighbor in such a prison himself is the one that goes to that prison. Because when the master heard of it, he says, take this ungrateful servant and put him in prison instead of the one that holds him money. So I want to encourage you today. Even though the master had forgiven him, the fact that he did not forgive others, his forgiveness was reversed. God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus. The moment Jesus said, it is finished, but it is not left to you to maintain your forgiveness because freely have you received, therefore freely give. So I want to encourage you today, tell yourself, the reason why this is a form of deliverance is because many of the unforgiveness or much of the unforgiveness that we hold against ourselves is not even in our conscious thoughts, is in our subconsciousness. You don't know the reason why you're not confident enough to do certain things is because you haven't forgiven yourself for failing the last time you tried. And that lack of forgiveness is now hindering the confidence that God has given to you to become fully functional in your life unto fruitfulness. So as we sing that song again, I want you to begin to prophesy over yourself and say, I let myself go. I forgive myself because if I forgive any, they shall be forgiven. In the mighty name of Jesus. We're going to do some more praying, but let's take this song one more time. Father, we exalt you. Lord, we exalt you.
Jesus took very seriously was this concept of forgiveness there was a particular place wherein Jesus looked at a man whose hands had withered away like he he had been leprous for so many years or for a long period of time and his his hands are falling off due to leprosy now in case you haven't studied this on your own or heard somebody else say it Leprosy in the Old Testament was very symbolic of sin. And so whenever you see people being described as lepers, whatever is the summary of their experience is applicable to you as a New Testament believer when it comes to receive cleansing from your sins. And that is the reason why when Jesus ministered healing to people that were leprous, he ministered cleansing to them. He ministered to them what a cleansing. He would first of all cleanse them before getting them to be what? To be made whole. In fact, I think at this particular point in time, what we need to do is this. I don't want you to miss out on the power that is available in here to deliver and to set free. I want to explain a couple of things to you because I can see that many of us are thinking that we love ourselves so much that we're not holding ourselves in a grudge. But if it were not so, the Lord would not have told me. So let's be seated for a little while and as soon as we grab our seats, please celebrate these guys and let's just give God thanks. That was an awesome, awesome worship experience. Oh yeah, so good to have she Shayla and John on stage today joining the leader. And uh, Diamond, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Alamos kitalando rigidush tablevedi yande. God is good. God is good. Alrighty. So let's um let's quickly deal with a couple of things here. All right, because a lot of what deals with us, a lot of what limits our ability to fulfill destiny and to do the will of God lies within us at a depth within us that we're mostly unfamiliar with. When you look through scriptures, you will see several references in scriptures made to the innermost parts of a man's heart. The Bible says that even you do not know your heart. And you're like, what does that even mean? I know what I'm thinking right now. Yeah, God is not too worried about what you're thinking right now. He's not too concerned, neither should you be too concerned about what you're thinking right now. What you should be more concerned is the thoughts that you are unconscious of that are ongoing in your heart. 
Let me break it down to you. I've done this a couple of times in the past, but this is one of those things that we cannot overemphasize. You see, David said something. He says, search me in the innermost parts of my being. He says, help me to know truth in the inward part. He's not talking about the fact that he doesn't know the truth in his thoughts, in his consciousness, but he knows that within that, beneath that, sub, that consciousness is the intents or is the intents of his heart. That's another old King James word that is being used to describe the subconscious mind. And he was begging God. He says, God, I want you to help me to search me. And one of the things that we know of is that David prayed that prayer all the time. To the point wherein when his son Solomon grew up, Solomon knew that prayer by heart. That was why Solomon said, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which he searches the inward parts of his belly. Because he knew that his father would always cry to God to fix the subconscious mind. One of our favorite scriptures of the New Testament is the word of God is living and powerful. We all know that scripture. We're always quoting that scripture. Sharper than any two-edged sword because it has the ability. The reason why we're excited about the word of God when we're quoting scriptures is because we know that it has the ability, as the Bible says, to penetrate the membrane that exists between soul and spirit. You see that, they call it the asunder. For those people who read the Bible in 1986 and you read the King James Bible, it is called the dividing asunder between soul and spirit. It is called the dividing membrane between soul and spirit. And that dividing membrane is the subconscious mind. And then the Bible helps us further by breaking it down, by saying that the word of God knows the thoughts and the intents of a man's heart. So your thoughts are different from your intentions. That is the reason why the Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Even you do not know. But the word of God is able to bring your subconscious mind into alignment with the word of God. You see, the reason why many of us have yet to receive the life that we believe God has for us and we have yet to receive the things that we have petitioned of God is because we are double-minded. The Bible says, a double-minded man, he's unstable in all his ways. Let not such a man expect to receive a thing from the Lord. And what does it mean to be double-minded? To be double-minded is not what it means, is not, not being able to decide what shirt to wear. That is indecisiveness. Indecisiveness is different from double-mindedness. Sometimes you're wondering whether you should wear your purple wig or your black brown wig sorry, your purple shirt or your brown shirt, and you can't decide. That is indecisiveness. So this is why you have to pray for me after the service. Because of all the examples I could have used, I could have used a shoe, a shirt, but then somehow I decided to use a wig. No weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. You see, you can, you can be in indecisiveness. That is not a big problem because indecisiveness is in the moment. But double-mindedness double is eternal. Because remember that there is a part of you that is resting on your spirit and your spirit is not bound in time. Your spirit is in eternity. That is the reason why the Bible says that though the outward man perishes, this isn't what I looked like 20 years ago. This isn't even what I looked like when I first came to America. When I first came to America, how could I have been a model? Six pack, broad shoulders. My wife was like, oh, yeah, that's my version of the six pack, whatever it was that I came with. I was 20 pounds lighter. But the Bible says that the outward man perishes. But the inward man is renewed every day. Why is that so? Because your inward man is not in time. Time is the only thing that keeps moving and as it moves, it keeps decaying. The Bible says that the world that we're in is constantly degenerating until it becomes hell. Not my words, Jesus said it. This world is perishing. 
The apostles came and they attested to it. They said, don't concern yourself with the things that you see because they haven't got that much time left. The things that you see are temporal. Even that mountain that seems to have been there for hundreds of years, eventually is going to take up and leave because even the mountains have had enough of all the foolishness that we're doing. You understand what I mean? The Bible says that the earth is groaning and after a while, it's going to open up its mouth and begin to swallow the things that are important to preserve them for the next dispensation before we ruin it. And so at the end of the day, this is what we know, that your spirit is not trapped in this chronos, in this particular time dimension. So if your spirit is in eternity, and that part of you that is handshaked all the time, or that is always in a handshake with your spirit, which is your subconscious mind, is that close to your spirit? Do you think it's in time? Your subconscious mind has eternal consequences. And that is the reason why the Bible says, the Lord speaking through Solomon in Proverbs, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the forces that govern life. Life that we see is bound in time. And you cannot govern a thing from within it. You can only govern it successfully from without it. And that is the reason why human beings cannot successfully self-govern. Not my words, God said it when the nation of Israel was asking for a king. God was like, this is not how it works. I did not design the system to be governed from within itself. I designed the system to be operated from above. The system is supposed to be operated from above. Imagine how scary it's going to be, Chris, if your computer can run itself. You wonder you just get there and your computer has ordered itself another screen and you pay for it. Okay, I know it's coming. Yeah, your car can order new tires when your account is already overdrawn by $108. And then it orders itself new tires. It even orders tires that you would not even consider buying. That would be chaos. And that is exactly what is going on in the world. We want to self-govern. New age theology is teaching us that we are the gods. Of course we're not. You know, you see a lot of the people who say that, oh, we are gods. We just don't know it. And I'm like, if you are an ignorant God, then you are not a God. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And so, so now one time. Oh, okay. My wife says, but some of them are goddesses. Okay. I wouldn't know anything about that, would I? <laughs> okay, but that is the reality of it, is that what governs the life that we see is not what things we see. The Bible says that the things that are seen are made and governed of the things that are not seen, such that the material world is a function of the immaterial. And so when the Bible says, out of your belly, Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it are the forces that govern life. He's telling you that the part of you that is most important is your subconscious mind. Do you know how many times you are consciously believing that in your conscious mind, Cornelia, you know that the Bible says that God is the healer and you're confessing that healing and then the more you confess it because you're shouting at the healing to come, the headache even increases. And nothing happens, but you're like, but I believe it. But do you really believe it in your subconscious? Because you only learned that scripture two years ago. But your subconscious mind has been even before you came to be. And so your subconscious mind, since you were growing up, you've been confessing negatively, you've been believing negatively, and your subconscious mind is like, what is all this new stuff that she's saying? We don't know this stuff. Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who is you? Your subconscious mind is a beast that needs to be tamed. And the Bible says you can only do so by the instrumentation of the word of God. Because where it sits, you cannot reach. There are so many people who have forgiven consciously their abusers. But for some reason, every time they see a particular kind of man, their world gets turned upside down. Subconsciously, they avoid going to certain places. They avoid making certain decisions. Even though they're not consciously thinking about the abuser from 16 years ago, but their subconscious mind has retained the trauma of that experience. 
And that is the reason why there is no genuine healing that happens up here. The healing has to touch deep down here. You see, a lot of what we need to be cleansed from, we are cleansed of or cleansed from in our conscious thoughts. But for us to be made whole, it has to be in the subconscious mind. And Jesus demonstrated that when a man was brought to him whose fingers had withered away. You see, leprosy is something that happens in the moment. But withering takes a long time to happen. And so the fact that his hands were withered was a depiction of what his soul looked like. And so when Jesus looked at the man, he wanted to teach us the principle of inner restoration. The principle of restoring what may have gone wrong in our subconscious mind. So in the presence of many witnesses, Jesus looked at the man and he said to him, stretch forth your hand. And the Bible says the one whose hands had withered, his hand came forth. But how did Jesus get him to stretch forth his hands? He said to him, these were the actual words that he used. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. He said, but for the sake of you people sitting down and wondering who is this carpenter's son who thinks he has the power to forgive. He says, now you watch this, stretch forth your hand. And the Bible says a new hand grew that was not there just a moment ago. How did that happen? By forgiveness. So if Jesus was able to restore that which was deeper than the conscious, that which was long-standing and deep-seated by issuing a forgiveness report, why shouldn't you and I be excited that he has given us the same power? He says, whosoever, anyone that you forgive, Matthew, you can forgive yourself. Anyone that you forgive will be forgiven. The reason why the Lord is saying to us today, I mean, let me tell you something. When the Lord announced that over today's service, I was excited. I almost couldn't wait to get here. I was excited. I went in the spirit. You know, sometimes you think you're already in the spirit. And then in the spirit, you receive a news of God that accelerates you even deeper into the spirit. I felt like Elijah in the moment who ran faster than chariots of horses because of the fact that I know what happens when a man is truly forgiven. Because when your sins are forgiven, you forgive yourself and then you forgive the ones that have wronged you. And by so doing now, you can appear before your heavenly father blameless. You know what happens when that experience becomes your experience? You are genuinely made whole. The Lord is saying today, I am fixing broken hearts. I am fixing corrupted intentions. Some of our intentions have been made corrupt. And the Lord is saying, we will fix that. Because until your subconscious mind is in alignment with your conscious mind, you are double-minded. One mind believes, the other mind does not. The Bible says you will not receive anything of the Lord. Think about it as a passageway. Heaven is back there with all of the blessings that you will ever need. The Bible says that God has given to you everything that pertains to your life and godliness. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So right there behind me is heaven. And the way the blessings of heaven travel down to the earth is by the beaming of the light of God's grace. And light as we know it travels in a straight line. And so if there is an opening here, the light is going to come to this dimension. But when, once it's come through this opening, if the next one is blocked off, guess what? The light does not shine. So you're busy confessing the promises of God, which is light, because the Bible says that the entrance of God's word brings light and it brings understanding onto the simple. You have light, but there is a blockade. And that blockade is because of the lack of alignment between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. When we were children, there was this experiment that we used to perform and it was called the pinhole experiment. I don't know what you all called it here, but this is what we would do in our classrooms. We would light a candle and then we will cut out two cardboards of the same shape and size. And then we'll put a hole in one of them and place it in front of the candle. And then you see the light of the candle travel through that hole, but you're holding the other cardboard. Behind the second cardboard, you cannot see that light. All you see is a shadow. 
until you make a hole that aligns with that other hole. Because the Bible says that God is light and with him there is no variableness, neither is there a shadow of turning. God is not going to bend his principles because of you. Even if he tries, he cannot because he goes straight. Let me say that again. God is light. With him there is no variableness, neither is there a shadow of turning. So God is not going to say, well, I understand that Alan truly believes that I can heal him even though his subconscious mind is not letting me go through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate around the subconscious mind. If God should ever do that, everything that we know of will dissolve completely into oblivion. Because God has to remain God for things to remain. Because the Bible says that in him all things consist and he upholds everything by the word of his power. Which means by his nature as light, he upholds everything. So if he bends the light because of you, everything just dissolves. Electrons can no longer hold together. Water stops being water. Oxygen would have to go its way. Hydrogen would have to go its way. And that is the reason why as much as God loves you, he needs you to be in alignment and in full understanding. Do you know one day the man of God saw God? He was sitting on his throne and his heart was broken. And he says, Father, what is the problem? He says, look at my people. They perish because of lack of knowledge. When we don't know how things work, there is almost nothing God can do. And that is the reason why it is important and critical for us to know exactly how to reorder the alignment that is missing or that may be missing in our lives. Your subconscious mind needs forgiveness. You need to forgive yourself deep within you. Now, the good news is you don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. But God says you can ask me. That was what David was doing. If I let's look at that Psalms 51 together. I believe that every New Testament believer needs to be able to recite Psalms, Psalms 51 by heart. It is such a psalm of the grace of God. Especially in these days that we are in the seventh church, the church of Laodicea, the church of the judgment of the people, wherein people believe that your righteousness has to be approved by them. If you're not doing things according to what pleases them, then you're a bad person. David says, against you alone have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found blameless when you judge and just when you speak. Why was he saying that? Because he had people outside of his gate with placards saying the king needs to be dethroned because he has done badly. And he was like, no, I didn't sin against you. He says, against the Lord alone have I sinned. Because if we don't understand that people would always bring their judgment, and a lot of human beings by natural disposition do not seek mercy, they seek judgment. That was why Jesus told the Pharisees, you know, Jesus and the Pharisees, they kept butting heads on the issue of forgiveness. Because Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost. And the Pharisees are like, no, we have come to punish the sinners. And in one, day, one day Jesus looked to them and he said to them, he says, if only you understood what you have read, which is written, that God desires mercy over judgment. He says, you will not castigate the guiltless. So you're here, concerned about what somebody else has done. But this man had a revelation that I'm not going to let other people determine my fate and my destiny. My case, I will settle with the Lord. Because he understands that it is not by fixing the tabloids or by fixing other people's conversations that his life will be fixed. It is by fixing his subconscious mind. Many of us are trying to get into every single conversation that is going on about us. We're trying to correct the opinions of men. When the subconscious mind that determines the course of your life still has the wrong opinion about you and you haven't fixed that. Can I say that again? Many of us, we're trying to know, oh, what is this person saying? Or oh, what is that person saying? Whatever they're saying has no bearing over your life. The Bible says you will be satisfied by the fruit of your own lips. A man is satisfied by the fruit of his lips, not by what man a leader is saying about him. Man a leader might be confessing great things over your life, but if you don't believe those things in your subconscious mind, at the end of the day, she will get her reward for trying, but then at the end of the day, what do you get? Absolutely nothing. And so that is the reason why we need to stop being bothered about all these things and focus on the one thing that is needful, which is to allow the instrumentation of the word of God that is living and powerful to penetrate your thoughts and fix your intentions. Many of us have good thoughts about church. 
Well, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves as the saints. And then you come around because your thoughts have now been fixed. You have repented in your thinking, but it hasn't yet settled itself within your subconscious mind, the reason why you're here. And that is the reason why when you come in and somebody doesn't say hello properly, you get angry and you go back home. But if it's already settled within your subconscious, like David said, he says, one thing have I desired and that will I seek after, that I may be in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord. When I come into God's house, I am looking to behold the beauty. I'm not looking for someone else's fault. Because what you look for is what you see. But if you come into the house of the Lord to behold the beauty, when you see people, you see all of the great things that God wants to do in their lives. You see all of the great transformations that God wants to do in their lives. I used to be an associate pastor and I was always concerned about how the service was going. Is the temperature okay? Is the seat comfortable? Is the singing going? And I was walking around. I was always walking around like a vacuum cleaner everywhere trying to pick up the dirt. No, I was literally like a human vacuum. I was picking up dirt behind people and smile so they don't get offended. It's all right, I'll get it. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, your shoes look tight. You want me to loosen them for you? In fact, that coffee doesn't suit you, you know? It doesn't match your skin tone. Can I give you some milk? Can I give you some cream? How was that dude who, who was policing everybody's lifestyle in the name of being nice? That's why I came, that's how I came to know that niceness is not the fruit of the Spirit. A lot of the times that we're nice, we're nice because it makes us feel good. Because we feel like people feel good about us. <laughs> there is nothing sacrificial about niceness. Kindness is sacrificial but not niceness. A lot of our niceness is for us. You know when you know that you, your niceness is for you. When you see somebody driving crazy on the road, what do you do? You let them pass like, go and hit somebody else, not me, not today, Satan. <laughs> You just go. Is it because you love them? No, it's because you're trying to avoid danger. Yeah. When we were coming, somebody came out of Kroger's. We were coming here, and he was driving like Jehu, the son of Nimshi. He was driving furiously. <coughs> Do you all know what did I just say now? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. No, no. Je Jehu was Jehu an Egyptian. No, Jehu was not an Egyptian. Jehu was an Israelite. Jehu was somebody in the Bible that the Bible described as a bad driver. Because one day there was a watchman on the tower. And they noticed that somebody was approaching the castle where they were in. And everybody was eager to know who it was. And they asked the watchman on the tower. I believe it's in 2 Kings. They said, who is it? He said, I cannot tell. He said, but by the driving, it is Jehu, the son of Nimshi. Because how be it, he driveth furiously. I don't even know where that came from. That is why you need to study the word of God because you never know when you're going to need it. It's just going to come on its own. So this person was driving like Jehu, the son of Nimshi. He caught in front of me and I wanted to honk, but I saw that my wife was there. When my wife is there, I'm a better Christian. Someone is like, wow, isn't that hypocrisy? No. The Bible says we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So let us run with meekness the race that is set before us. One of those times that the Bible tells you how to run the race is when there are clouds of witnesses. When there are no people around, y'all know how you are? So when my wife is in the car, I'm a better driver, I'm a better Christian, I listen to gospel music. You understand what I mean? I keep everything holy. Because if anything goes out of line, if I accidentally honk at someone, she would be like, oh, wow. So this is what you do when you're driving by yourself. And by that time, you cannot deny it because she just did it. So I wanted to honk and then I remember that she was there and that hand quickly became kind of like a wave offering to the Lord. I was just like that. But then guess what? I just let the guy go because I'm like, I do not want this guy to get me in trouble with the Lord. But at the end of the day, here is where I'm going with that. Oh, I, uh, you see, my dinner is already set. If you know, you know. But here is where I'm going with that. You see, many of us, we think consciously that we're doing that which is right. But deep within our subconscious, we're doing it for ourselves. While I was that associate pastor, I was nice, very nice, always been nice. And one day we were in a midweek service and I was really concerned about all of what was going on and the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, get up and come here. So I got up from where I was. I came, I went to the, to the side of, of, I was still, I was sitting somewhere like that, 
where I could see everybody. He said, get up. And so I got up and I came forward and he said to me, he said, do you want to fix what is really wrong with people? I said, yes. He said, because I can see your entire thought was fixing all of what is around here. He says, now go to the back of the church and I will show you what is wrong. And I went to the back of the church and he said to me, you see that person? She's living in unforgiveness. You see that person is suffering from a curse of borrowing money. No matter where he's at in life, he still borrows money. And he started pointing people out to me one by one. After about 14 people, I almost couldn't handle it anymore. I'm like, man, well, how come I'm here in this church? There might be something wrong with me too. Because if this is the church where I've been hanging out and everybody has all of these issues going on. But you know what? That marked a great change in my life because that had never happened to me before. Wherein the Lord was reading me people's emails. You see, the real issue with us is not the one that we are conscious of, the one that we are focused on. The real issue with most of us is what we are not even aware of and the devil is aware of it. And that is the reason why he continues to mess us about. Psalms 51. Okay, let's read Psalms. This is Isaiah. I was wondering because I looked at it at first and I'm like, wow, is this another universe? Okay, Psalms 51. Alrighty, only my conspiracy theory people got what I just said there, but it's okay. The Bible says here, uh, let's just jump to where it is. Let's start reading from verse 5. If I let's read from verse 1, just so that you know it blesses somebody. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I'm going to say this very quickly because the Lord said this to me as I was walking away from you earlier, Justin. The Lord said to me, he says, this one time I will grant that which you ask. He says, but it doesn't have to be this way. The Lord does not want you to approach him to come when you need to decide. He says, I need you to walk with me in a close step. He said, but this time around, I am shining light even this moment into your heart so that you know that path that you must take. Last Saturday when we were here, and I believe the reason why the Lord was drawing you to come here last Saturday was the Lord gifted us in perfection, the Yorim and the Thummim, the divine ability as the priest before God to be able to decide where we must go at every time. The Bible says whether you turn to the left or to the right, you will hear a voice telling you this is the way. But one of the things that the Lord is saying today to you is that there needs to be more of a close step between you and him. You see, it has to be more consistent, it has to be more dynamic because there is more that he wants to give to you and give through you to other people. You see, let me tell you something, Justin, your tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. And the Lord wants to activate that sequence. He wants to activate that process. He wants to activate that gift in you. And the only way by which it's going to be flowing continually is if it is always being pumped. The Bible says, out of, your, out of your belly or from your belly shall flow the rivers of living waters. If it's only spouting every now and again, it is not the will of God. It has to be a flow. Praise the Lord. So let's go back here. And it says here in Psalms 51 verse 5, behold, no, we haven't gotten to that. We were in um, verse 3. For I acknowledge my trans transgressions. Ah, kasi dumba adiyanamosa. Let's read verse 1 again. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. So you are not late to the game. So forgive yourself for thinking you could have started earlier. They told you about it. You knew about it. You knew when other people were doing it. You could have gotten on it too, but you didn't. The Lord is saying, tell Alan to forgive himself. He says, because I make everything beautiful in my time. You see, so when that thought is bubbling in your subconscious mind, the next time it comes, the word of God is like a, is like a shower that will quench that flame and you will be at peace. And then soon afterwards, what will you see? The Lord says to me, tell this man that the flower will blossom. Even the ones who have put their seed in the ground long before you will come and wonder how you're doing it. You see what I mean? So you don't worry about the time. You are not late to the game. Verse 1 says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my... Brother Matthew, the Lord says, it is not in your nature to judge them. He said, but by retaliation, 
you have been judging them. Because there was a time that they were judging you. There was a time that they were monitoring you. There was a time that they were suspicious of every move that you made. And your subconscious mind adopted retaliation and you're judging them subconsciously. And the Lord says that is not you. Because in your consciousness, you simply want to love. And you've been wondering where that bad blood is from. Why is this resistance between me and this person? Why is there hesitation? Why isn't there a flow of virtue? It's because at the subconscious level, there is no cordiality. The Lord says that vengeance is mine. And that is being taught to your subconscious mind this very moment. And you will love as you consciously love, you will subconsciously love. And you will see such a great transformation. They were trying to cut you off, but now they will seek you. That will be a sign unto you. They will seek you. You know what the Lord showed me? They opened their book and they saw your face. And every page they turned, they kept seeing your face. And on the other side of the page is a message for you. Their heart already knows that which they must say to you. It is coming. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's just move on to verse chapter 2. I mean verse 2, otherwise we're going to keep doing this. Because every time I read that, I see somebody else in there. He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Alrighty. You see, let me tell you something. This one is for my wife. No matter how passionate you get about fixing people, they're only going to be fixed to the level that they are ready to be fixed. You see, one of the things that you have struggled with because you were asking me the other day, oh, you prayed for everybody, you didn't pray for me. I smiled because I'm thinking to myself, this thing that the Lord has revealed to me, how do we deliver it? So this is it, this is the delivery of it. You see, they do not believe in themselves as much as you believe in them. You understand what I mean? And so the only anger that rises within you at their lack of discretion is of the Lord. It is a holy anger that is of the Lord. But guess what? Let it not consume the flower that is in you. Let that anger remain the anger of the Lord. You see, there are certain things that the Lord is unhappy with. And by divine knowledge and understanding, we'll come to know that God is unhappy with those things. And after a while, we want to take that anger and make it our own. Then we want to be angry with people's foolishness. And God is like, wait a minute, that anger is mine. I just revealed it to you so that at least I can carry you along, but I didn't say carry it and take it over from me. And so now your heart will be tender toward the ones who have refused to grow, the ones who have refused to mature, the ones who have refused to repent. Your heart will be tender toward them. You see, it's a subconscious thing. You see, because something within you knows where they could be. You know prophetically where the Lord wants to take them. And you see how they're holding themselves back, but the Lord is saying no. In English, what the Lord is saying is don't take it personal. God says, I have a different timeline that I've got them on. In the meantime, let not the petals of your flower be hampered, be touched. You just leave it to the Lord. You see, this is healing. I know that it's not the way you think, but it is the way your subconscious mind organizes things. Let me tell you something. One of the things that I've come to recognize is if God knows that he can trust you with people, he will show you things. I remember one day the Lord showed me the filer in someone's heart. The subconscious mind is like a library wherein there are files, there are books, there are records. And I saw the filer almost like a monk, dressed like a monk, and it was filing things. And immediately I showed up. It knew that I was there. It was almost going to turn around and the Lord said to me, just be still. And then the filer continued to file. Let me tell you something. Because... God cares so much about people and he loves you so much that he wants you to be in his company. He will take you to places where he is doing the work of restoration. But only if he knows that when you get there, the only thing that you bring with you is love because any other thing can contaminate them and bring destruction. Let me say that again. You see, the, the innermost part of the human being the subconscious mind is the most sensitive. Any little contamination results in a huge pollution. And that is the reason why God reserves that right to his word. And that's why the Bible says that no one knows that subconscious mind but the Lord. And he controls what goes in there by his word. But he wants you to be a part of what he's doing. He wants to reveal things to you concerning people. But will you take any sentiment with you as you go? Or is it going to be all love? You know what happens? Let me tell you exactly what I saw before that vision ended. What I saw before that vision ended was that subconscious mind that seemed to turn around to look and see who it was, stopped 
from turning around because it knew that it was God and it didn't have to be bothered. And it continued doing what it was doing. And then the vision was zoomed out and I saw myself and I was in God. While I was there, I thought I was standing by God. No, God says you were not by me. He says you were in me because I am love. You see, when you are love, God is love. He will allow you to go to places that is reserved for God alone. So you want to make a difference in the lives of people? Be in love. And when you are in love, let me tell you something. <laughs> the kind of authority that God is going to grant to you to love on people, to be patient with people. You understand what I mean? I was telling my wife while we were coming in here. I said, I can imagine that Jesus laughed a lot while he was here. Because the level that Jesus was at, a lot of what people said and did was funny. Foolish, but funny. You understand what I mean? And when you look at your own life, certain things that you used to believe, certain things that you used to do, while you were already walking with the Lord and you thought you were having a great time with Jesus. Now when you think back seven years, you're like, God, how did you even stomach that level of understanding? How did you remain my friend when I was thinking like that? I tell you some of the times in my life that I felt like I was closest to God. Late 90s, early 2000s. I shut down everything, dropped out of school, did almost nothing. I was doing businesses here and there, but they were very, and I'm gonna tell you this, it seems a little unfair, but I was doing businesses that was making me a lot of money even though I wasn't doing a lot of work because I wasn't doing it physically, I was doing it by revelation. I didn't see the entire picture of what I needed to do, but I recognized that there was a voice that was leading me onto profit. The Bible says wisdom is profitable to direct. So the instructions will come like this. Get up, go to your brother's house. Oh my God, it's four hours away. But the word says, get up and go. So I would go and I would sit there and he'd be having a hard time with something. And I'm like, why am I here to listen to this complaining and stuff? And the voice will come again and say, get up, go to the living room and sit there. And one day, this, was a, this is a true example. I went to the living room, I sat there. And my brother didn't, didn't even come. He wasn't happy to see me because I was a student, supposed to be broke as chalk. He knew that I would pinch him for money before going back. And so he wasn't particularly happy that I came. So he left, he stayed in his room, he just left me to my own devices. And one of his friends walked in with a huge suitcase. And it looked like he had a burden. I was like, what is it you carry that I may relieve you of it? I said that by the Holy Spirit. He says, if you want to, it's yours. I said, what is it? He said, it's a special collection of stationery. He said, it just got delivered to me from overseas and I, did not, I don't even know who to sell it to. And I'm like, so you mean I can just take it? He said, take it. Whenever you sell it, give me the money. And I took it and I went from my brother's house. Now, let me tell you this because of the fact that we need to know how the wisdom of God leads us to profit. Because many of us, we want God to show us the entire picture of how we're going to close that deal before we make a move. And God is like, what is the point? If I already show you everything, even do not unbelievers do the same. If you tell everybody the whole picture, they know what to do. God wants you to do it by faith. Because he wants you to do it with him by your side every step of the way. So he will give you one at a time. The Bible says, to whom shall God, to whom shall God reveal understanding? Who is he that the Lord will teach wisdom? Is he not the one that is willing to take one step after a step? A precept upon a precept. A line upon a line. The wisdom of God is not downloaded like you download movies on iTunes. The wisdom of God comes sometimes one bite at a time. Pun intended. And so I left. I went to the bus stop. I was going to take the usual bus that goes to the campus, to go to, that goes to the town where my campus was. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he says, don't get on that bus. You can't afford it. I was like, yes, I can. And then he looked at me and he was like, how? I said, I have my tithe. So I'm going to add my tithe to the bus fare. And when I sell this stationery, I will pay you back. And he was like, knock yourself out. So I got on that bus, really excited and really eager to go sell this merchandise. I didn't know yet where to sell it to, but I was eager. Because I'm like, man, look at how God has chosen to bless me just by obeying. So I got on that bus and I paid. I opened my Bible, took out of my tithe to add to the fair. And the Lord said to me, you can't afford it. Take that one. And I'm like, no, there's no way I'm going to get into that rickety bus. It's not going anywhere. So I got into the nice shiny one. And about 10 minutes out of town, it wasn't an accident. 
It was literally like somebody slapped the bus off the road. It did not hit anybody. Nobody hit it. The next thing we knew, we were in the bush. The next thing, people were trying to get us out. That was when I woke up. I was like, what's going on here? And they were like, oh, this person is still here. Oh, that person is still here. And then they pulled us out. I was so in love with that money potential that the, the bag was still in my hand, even though the car had been in an accident. So as they were pulling me out of the bus, I was pulling the bag. So they laid us on the side of the road. Some people couldn't stand, but I was still able to stand. By the grace of God, not a single scratch. And then the Holy Spirit was like, wow, this is the same bus that you thought was nice and shiny. Guess what took me from that place? That rickety bus. The rickety bus overtook this one that had fallen in the bush. He parked up front. But because it was so rickety, he didn't want people to approach it and maybe break down the door. So he left his bus in the, direction, in the distance and he came, of all the people that were there, he came to me. He was like, I saw you by my bus at the bus stop. I said, yeah. He said, I think I know where you're going. I said, yeah, I'm going where you're going. He said, okay, I'm gonna help you with your suitcase. And he took me, and they had only one seat left. Which was very unusual. My wife knows those people. If they don't fill up all their seats, they don't move. He said, I'd been there all day, and we couldn't fill up that one seat, and people were asking for their money back. So he was like, I would rather just go with that one seat than to give their money back. He took me, and it was while I was in that bus that conversations led to conversation, and I received information about someone looking for that material. I sold every single one of those things for a price that was almost ungodly. I don't even know how I got into all of those things, but I want to tell you that at that particular season in my life, I felt so close to the voice of the Holy Spirit and I would write things down. About seven years after I left that place, I found one of my notes. It was like a comic book. Some of the things that I thought were deep revelations. When I read them, I was like, Holy Spirit, but how did you even allow for me to run with this for a while? It was like, when you are a child, you speak as a child. You think as a child. You understand as a child. He says, I will not rob you of your childhood, but I will watch you grow. But let me tell you something. You know what Paul said? He says, when I was a child, that was what I did. I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. He says, but now I put away childish things. Some of us need to put away childish things. Those little toys. Those friendships that always make you do things that you used to do 15 years ago. It's time for you to say to them, where sin has enticed me, I will not consent. Let's read verse three. It says, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Not so that I can be a foolish person. No, that you may be found blameless when you judge and just when you speak. I say it the other way because that's how I remember it. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. This is the reason why I'm saying that from time, from the word go, your subconscious mind has been in need of repentance and forgiveness. Okay? Because some of you think, well, it's not my fault that my subconscious mind is the way it is. No, it isn't but it is your responsibility to fix it. It is not my fault that the world has become immoral, but guess what? I am the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So guess who's going to fix it? We are going to fix it. You see, every time I was like, oh, Jesus, why don't you just come now? And Jesus says, well, I'm only coming to give you a hand. You're still fixing this mess. And you have a thousand years to do it. And guess what? When God gives you a thousand years, I guarantee you, you would need all of those thousand years. And that is the reason why the mess has to be really much so that we can be busy for the thousand years. I'm not worried about the decadence that is in the world. I'm excited because I'm not going to be bored when the millennial reign comes because every single one of us will be alive for a thousand years working almost every day. I think we would have a day off every week, but hey, it is what it is. You understand what I mean? And, and, and the joy and the thrill of it is you get to walk alongside with Jesus. You understand what I mean? Because the world that we're going to after the thousand years is called what? The new, wrong, go and read your Bible again. It is called the new heavenly Jerusalem because the maker and builder is God. If it was just the new Jerusalem, then you, Nehemiah, has to build the walls. 
But because it's called the heavenly Jerusalem, the Bible says it comes down from heaven already built and sealed with a bow on top. When the man of God saw it, he thought it was a woman. That was how beautiful it was. He called it a bride. And so if you're going to go there and do absolutely nothing but burn incense before the Lord, you better enjoy the work that is ahead of us. Enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. Alrighty. So he, this is where we're going. He says, while I was yet in my mother's womb, there was already sin. Before I was brought forth, there was already iniquity. And how many of you remember the day you came out of your mother's womb? Okay, Cam, Cam Nade, you look like a very brilliant student. Two weeks before you were born, can you remember what you were doing? Oh, what a disappointment. Justin, do you remember what you were doing? Okay, wow. So what does that mean? Our consciousness were not yet as active while we were in our mother's womb. So when your consciousness is not active, what is running your soul? Your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind already knows these things. When I was much younger, there were things that I would remember about my childhood. I remember just before I was two years old, my sister, she nearly dropped me from the balcony. They still don't know till today how come I was still hanging there somewhere between the balcony and the ground. And I, the day that I told my mom the story, she quickly covered my mouth. She was like, you're not supposed to remember that. I said, well, I don't know. For some reason, I remember it. Because in reality, is none of those things get deleted. Let me say this again very slowly. None of those things get what? Get deleted. If you want, you can access those things. It is there. The things that have happened in the past, the things that happened four, five hundred years ago, there were things that the Holy Spirit allowed for me to remember about the life of Moses, about the life of David, that were not even contained in the details of the 66 books. And the Holy Spirit allowed me to know those things simply because I wouldn't let him alone. I wanted to know. The Bible says he knows who shows the curiosity to know. That's what the Bible says. He knows who follows to know. When you, when you pester God, he will reveal things to you. Some of the time, even if it's not your business, lest you weary me, the Lord will say, there you go. Can, are you happy now? Can we keep doing what we need to do here? And that is because I, have, I was born nosy. You understand what I mean? There are things that I have had to learn, but some of you need to learn how to be nosy. You understand what I mean? I was born nosy. That's why sometimes I don't focus on any one task at the, at the same time because I'm still here. I'm always... That's why I can't preach a 20-minute sermon because I have to share with you a testimony from 1998 even if it doesn't have anything to do with the sermon. That's just because that is the way that I am built. But I am learning from my wife how to focus on one task. But she wasn't particularly born nosy, so I'm teaching her to be nosy. When my wife has a dream and she's telling me the dream, I'm like, okay, so what happened when they showed you that in the dream? She was like, uh, nothing. You didn't ask what that could mean? You saw a door, you didn't even try to open it. My wife is learning to be nosy because I tell her, when you tell me your dream, I am not hearing a dream. 90%, if not 95% of the time that people tell me dreams, I'm not hearing the dream. I'm hearing the interpretation of the dream because the moment you tell me you have a dream, I am just waiting for you to say one thing and I will use that thing to get to where you are and I am seeing the interpretation of the dream. And so it bothers me when people leave things on the table. Like, If I saw a door in the dream, I am trying to open it. Unless they tell me, son of man, do not. And at that point, I'll be like, why? Why not? You see what I mean? Because, okay, anyway. <laughs> the Bible says that by wisdom a house is built, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge it is filled with all precious things. You see, God, by his wisdom, allows for you to have a building in this existence that is called destiny. And by his benevolence, he allows for you to have the instrumentation of his word and his Holy Spirit to receive the understanding to be established in your calling. But then it is up to you to go and gather the knowledge of what you want to furnish your house with. God is not that kind of father that allows for you to have a house and allows for the house to be established and is still the one helping you to go to Target to pick up your foot rug or your throw pillow. At least do some things for yourself. He's God, your father, not God, your mother. 
And that is the reason why it is important for us to gather knowledge because the more knowledge you have, the more your house is filled with precious things. Simply because the Bible says that buy up opportunities for the days are evil. There are times when we go through spiritual drought. There are times when you're faced with situations or other people are faced with situations where you have to be able to go into your house and bring things for them because that is the will of God for you. Jesus says a scribe that is instructed in the things of God brings from his treasures things that are both old and new. But many of us, when people come to you troubled by demonic spirits, you do not have anything to bring out to replenish them or to help them. Simply because God has given you the opportunity to go to places but you are not gathering while you're there. You need to gather. The Bible says, in all you're getting, get understanding. You have to go and get stuff. I challenge you today. Let me tell you something. There was a time in my life that it was a big deal to study two chapters a day. I used to be very proud of myself. And then after a while, the Holy Spirit challenged me. He said, why don't you double that? Read two chapters in the New Testament. And read two chapters in the Old at first I was like, well, if the Holy Spirit is asking me to do that, at least by tomorrow he will know how well I can do. Because I was a slow reader until recently. And so guess what happens? I pushed myself. And I was doing that every single day. But because I know how easily distracted I get, I have to make a commitment that I will not have a bath until I have studied the two chapters of the old and the two chapters of the new. And if I had appointments, places to go to, I wouldn't go. This started before I took my leave of absence from school. So there were times when I had lectures and I didn't want to go to my lectures smelling like a pig. And so I had to make the call. It's either I study this word and go and meet somebody later on to teach me what they said in class, or I go to class and not study this word, but know that I am failing what is really important. Let me tell you something. Many of us, because of the fact that this world has placed so much demand on us from the time that we were young, we put premium on the things of the world above the things of the word. If you would take God's word as important as it really is, you will make time to study it. If you take your conversations with heaven and your participation in the meetings of the celestial as important as the meeting in your workplace, let me tell you something, you will see visions. You all know, I've been through seasons in my life, particularly in 2021. I was in and out of meetings in heaven. Angels will be having meetings outside of heaven, outposts of heaven. I will show up there. I will sit down and watch them eat, watch them talk, look at people's mouths, look at the way they're built, look at their makeup. And do you know how that has helped me? It has transformed my prayer life because now when I am praying and I'm hearing certain voices in heaven, I can picture which angels or regiment of angels produce that kind of sound. It allows for me to be more confident in the place of prayer. So when I'm declaring certain things, it's already done simply because I know the guys who are working on the case. But things like that do not happen accidentally. I wasn't taught those things at school. Many times Satan will come to me through friends who will give me a call. One day recently, no longer ago, one of my friends sent me a couple of islands. He was like, hey, you want to join me? Let's buy this one. I'm about to buy that one. Maybe you can take the third one. And the devil was like, you see yourself? You can't afford any one of those islands, can you? He said, and these are one of the people that you mentored in business. He said, now you're here. You say you're prophesying uh, that you're seeing angels. Look at you. The devil will come to tempt you with those material things. But then I laughed simply because the Lord had shown me a continent that could be mine in the millennia that people don't even know exist. So it's not like I'm going to go there and somebody's going to be following me and say, oh, I want to take it from you. I'm like, take what? Do you even know where I'm going? You understand what I mean? You need to be able to put premium on the things of eternity. Otherwise, Satan will keep your entire existence busy with shadows and the things that are temporal. The Bible says, let your attention be on things above and not on things beneath because the things that you see are temporal, but the ones that you do not see are eternal. I will not sacrifice these 100 years. I will, I will not sacrifice eternity for these 100 years. No. Some people may overtake me in material things, but the day they come to realize what is important, they will find me already standing at the gate. You're like, 
Yeah, you can meet Abraham, meet Moses, not meet Moses. Let me encourage you. This is an uncommon meeting. This is not where we have the best music in the world. This is not where we have the best coffee. For crying out loud, Shayla made coffee today. Yeah, and that's Shayla who is not even a barrister, but we had no choice. I'm saying that because there are churches that you can go to, meetings that you can go to, that the people who make coffee are professionals who are contracted seven years in advance. No, these things happen. They're contracted, they're professional. They show up at every meeting. They don't need to be praying while Sheila is making coffee to pray that at least it comes out well. You understand what I mean? But what I'm saying is if you make a sacrifice to be in a meeting like this, you might as well be rich in the things of the spirit. You can't come here and be subject to my 90 minutes teachings and yet not grow. No, what, then you are of all men most miserable. You understand what I mean? So I'm encouraging you to pay attention to these things because these are the forces that govern life. Very soon people will know. I was sharing with my brother Matthew yesterday. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that a time is coming on this earth wherein this was God speaking that to find a mortal man it will be a man will be rarer than gold. To find a good man is going to be rarer than finding a 24 karat gold. Usually you will not see the word 24 karat gold in the Bible. What you will see is the gold of Ophir. The gold of Ophir is gold that is so pure you can almost see through it. Yeah, have you ever seen gold like that? It is so rare and God says very soon to find a good man will be like that. You understand what I mean? And so when you know that these are the things that are coming upon the world, then why would you be running helter-skelter like everybody? Because people, guys, prophecy will be fulfilled whether we like it or we like it. And so when the Bible says that a third of humanity will be destroyed in a single attack by the enemy, imagine how many billions of people that is. You know what Brother Matthew asked me? He said, what if it has already happened? I said, are you referring to the zombie apocalypse? He said, yes. Because look around you today, there are so many walking dead people, people who are full of the world and void of the spirit. People are full of all kinds of knowledge in stock trading, in Bitcoin trading, but they do not even know the first thing about prayer. They do not even recognize anymore the needs of their spirit man to be in close proximity with God, to be able to sing in the spirit and pray in the Holy Ghost. People don't know. But you can't be alive truly before God if you do not know these things because the Bible says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is what we call life and peace. If you're not mindful of the things of the spirit, there is no life, there's no peace. So I challenge you today, boost your word study life. There are so many people here that can study five chapters a day. Do it because of the fact that your life depends on it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Especially in the season that we're going to, the world is going to be subject to famine. Economies are going to tumble. What are you going to live on? Imagine what happens by the time, uh, what's it called, fiat gets decommissioned and digital currency or whatever they replace it with is being rationed and controlled. I remember the other day when they told China that they were going to a digital currency. Everybody was like, yay, whoa, whoa. They went to digital currency and now they have just been told that some of that digital currency is about to expire, which means if you have already amassed that money, it just disappears. They're not wicked, they're fulfilling scripture. The Bible says wealth that men trust in will develop wings and fly away. The volatility of material things is so high, but people are not aware of it because if you know the truth about money, you're not going to slave for it. If you know the truth about material things, you will not put your trust in them. Neither will you give the best of yourself to chasing mammon. You will give the best of yourself to chasing God. Because if you seek first that kingdom of God and its righteousness, every other thing is going to be added unto you. 
I am a living witness because by the grace of God, when others were chasing shadows and chasing degrees that, worth, that are worth nothing today in the open market, I was chasing after God. I was spending the best of my time studying scriptures, praying in the Holy Spirit, waiting in the corridors of heaven to see if I would hear anything. There were days that I heard nothing, but I still fasted the next week and waited maybe something is going to drop out of the sky. You see me today and God reveals things to me about people. I'm reading scriptures at the same time I'm seeing visions. I'm seeing visions at the same time I'm in a trance. It was an accident the right price was paid and you haven't even seen anything yet because I am only still warming up the true riches that God has endowed me with in the process of chasing me is perseverance and sustenance in the day of trouble and that great tribulation hasn't come you come and see the likes of me in the great tribulation and you'll be like did this guy bring heaven with him to the party yes because I will so I want to encourage you, don't wait until the evil day. This is the time to prepare. This is the time to abandon yourself in the presence of God. Let me say this, and I can't say this too much. You need to put yourself on the schedule. What are we doing this week? We have been praying for an hour. Last night, I was hanging out with the men. At least, or maybe with the men, because most of them had gone before I finished my other meeting. And I looked at Brother Matthew. I said, Brother Matthew, it's 11.20. I need to go home because I know that I hadn't completed my one hour. If you know me, I'm like a baby. Once I get home, I run upstairs to my wife to go get a cuddle. But by the time I got home, I couldn't run upstairs. I was on the turf in the backyard walking in that grass. And you know me, I'm, I'm easy to scare. So if a deer were to show up, I would be running in the other direction. But I'm like, yeah, I would rather run praying than go in the comfort of the house and fall asleep. If you don't put yourself on a schedule sometimes, other schedules will try to overrun you. You are the most precious commodity on the earth. Everybody's out to get you. Nothing runs on earth without the human attention and the human blood. Nothing runs. And that is the reason why if you do not schedule and discipline yourself to apply your heart to the things of God, the world has a way of taking advantage of you all the time and taking up all your time and all your resources. Do you know how many of us try to study the Bible at night and we fall asleep? Not because you're lazy, because you're tired. Because all day, things have been getting your attention. Oh, they call you from work. Your children need you. Sometimes you need yourself. You spend 15 minutes trying to look better than you did yesterday. But if you don't put yourself on a schedule and discipline yourself, guess what happens? Time will just flit by, I mean, we, 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 we fly by, and you are still not growing spiritually. The Bible says buy up opportunities for the days are evil. What are the opportunities that you need to buy? Today, use your time to buy rec revelation. Use your time to buy friends in heaven. Remember that servant whose master said, I'm about to fire this lady. It wasn't a lady, it was a man. He said, I'm about to fire this dude. And because he heard of it, he went to the people who were owing money to the master. And he says, you owe my master a hundred denarii. Write 80. Take your pen right now. Do it by your own hand. It's not me. He didn't write it for them. He told them to write it by themselves. He went to the one that was owing the master 50. He said, you owe my master 50 denarii. Write 30. And he gathered the account and presented it to the master. And the master was like, wow, you've done well. He wasn't, going to be, he wasn't going to deliver a record, but he delivered that record so that he can look good to the master and at the same time look good to those other people. And what did Jesus say? You and I would have said, oh, that guy is a fraud. Jesus says, blessed is that servant, for he acted wisely, using mammon to secure for himself eternal friendships. Jesus commended using mammon to secure for yourself eternal friendships. Some of us may have to sacrifice going to get our nails done to get someone to come clean your house so that you can spend six hours studying Matthew. Not this one, the one in the Bible. Even though if you study Brother Matthew, you would do very well because he's so sold out for God. You understand what I mean? But many of us need to learn how to do things like that. We need to learn how to sacrifice material things for the things of God. When we came to this country as a family, we had a disappointment about a job that I had already secured. And my natural inclination was to go out there and go find another one. And the Lord said to me, where exactly are you going? I said, just anywhere. He said, I didn't make you to go just anywhere. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by God. And the Lord says to me, this time is no different from the other times. You have to wait until I say it's time to move. So what did I do? I sat at home. I was studying the Bible. I was praying. I wasn't even playing with my little boy. 
as much because if I went to work, I wouldn't be playing with him. So most times from that nine to five that people are at work, I'm in my closet praying. The, the first week, if my wife notices that the room is not shaking, she will come and shake the room because that means this dude is sleeping. And she's not going to tolerate any laziness. If you're not out there making money, you have to be here making friends in heaven. She will shake the room. But after like two weeks, she didn't have to come and shake the room because by then the savings was running low. Even me, I was shaking heaven. Like God, you said I should wait. I'm waiting, waiting. This was two years later, exactly two years after that wedding experience. If I, about two days after I came out of that closet, the Lord gave me an idea. And two years later, I received an offer to sell that intellectual property for more money than I had ever seen. At least in my very humble experiences. That is the faithfulness of God. When I told one of my friends that my client is offering to buy my company, he said, which one? I said, that's what I thought too. I started this thing two years ago. He said, but for two years, more than two years, I've been trying to sell my company that is actually really making money. I said, I know. I said, this is nothing but the grace of God. He told me himself, he says, the Lord is with you. I said, he is. So what am I saying? If you would give to God your very best, he will give to you his very best. You see, God is so faithful and he will not owe you. The Bible says an unjust weight is an abomination to God. If you give God your best, God will give you his best. The reason why we'll be getting the, the, the crumbs and the scraps that are falling out of heaven is because God has been getting the crumbs and the scrap that is falling out of your own table too. Your employer gets the best of you and your maker doesn't. Alrighty, let's land this plane before people start falling asleep. But where I was really going is this verse 6. It says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. There is an inward part. I can't see your thought right now. Why? Because it's inside of you. But even you cannot see your subconscious because it's hidden from you. So you can see that there are not two parts to every one of us. The inward part and the hidden part. This scripture that I was reading earlier, um, I believe that some of us have been wondering where it is. Um, let me help you find it. And then we're going to close. Alan, can we break bread? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Is where you have that scripture that says. If I let us read verse 11. Verse 11 is exactly where many of us are. And what does it say? It says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. You know, I've been talking to you about diligence today. You see, because something needs to motivate you. Having the Lord perform a miracle of deliverance is not the end, it's only the beginning. The promise that God made to us concerning this service is that we shall be delivered of unforgiveness in our subconscious mind, but with deliverance brings about what? A cleansing and a restoring, but now you have to do the work of filling up yourself. You see, because Jesus says, when a man is delivered of an evil spirit, of an unclean spirit, that same demon or unclean spirit will go away for some time. But then whenever it comes back and he finds that the room that he was driven out of is still clean and garnished without anything inside, it will register that observation and then go into outer darkness and find seven stronger demons than himself. And why is he going to look for seven strong, stronger demons than himself? Because they're like, this time around, ain't nobody driving us out. And the Bible says, Jesus speaking, it says that man's latter state is worse than the former. And so when God brings deliverance, from my own experience, we have had many aborted deliverances because when people bring to us the news of deliverance, they bring it with excitement. And after the deliverance has happened, we go to party. But I have since learned that when you bring a, a news of deliverance, you need to bring a warning of diligence and a, motiv and a motivation for intercession. Simply because you have to immediately be filled. So the Lord is delivering us, is healing us 
of all the unforgiveness that we have held of ourselves, we have held ourselves in unforgiveness for the things that have happened in the past subconsciously in the hidden part of us, God says, today, leave that to me. I will fix that. If I have to show you in the dream so that you can partner with me to release yourself of the things that you have failed to do that is still stopping you from winning at life. He says, I will do that. He said, but once it is done, I need you to be diligent to fill yourself up with the right stuff. To load yourself up with the word of God. Simply because God needs to continue to work on reconstructing that broken subconsciousness. And the word of God is the builder. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, the labor in vain who build it. And Jesus says, I will build my church. So let's look at what it says. Verse 11 again. He says, this is Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is in the New Testament. Chapter 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner. Now let me stop here real quick. I'm glad that by the Holy Spirit I did not forget. God by myself, I had already forgotten. The Lord says to me that many of us, the healing that we need in our bodies has to happen in our bone marrow. It needs to happen where, you see, a lot of the building blocks of our repair system is formed within the marrow of our bones. So if your body is not able to repair itself, that is the reason why it throws symptoms at you to go and get help outside. But sometimes, a lot of what we try to go get help for is available to us to present to our faculties. Your body is made by God to be efficient, to be effective, and to be vibrant. And this is what many of us are missing. We're missing the instrumentation of the Word of God that can actually go to correct the codes that may have been corrupt in our repair system. The Bible says the word of God can pierce and penetrate your joints and your marrow. A lot of what people go to the hospital for, for this procedure or that procedure, they have to cut you open simply because if they don't get in there, they can't fix or even understand the problem. And the word of God, the Lord is saying that his word can do that. He's not just talking about your mind, but he's talking about your joints, your bone, and your marrow. The same word of God. God is not speaking in metaphors here. He's actually speaking plainly. He's speaking plainly that the word of God is what living and powerful and it can penetrate your subconscious mind. It can attend to your joints, to your bone, to your marrow. Because the Bible says it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of a man's heart. I'm going to reveal this little secret to you and I want you to seek God further concerning it because it is able to transform your very existence and it should. You should let it. And what is that secret? You see the human body runs by communicating one part to the other. When your eyes see that there is fire, it tells your fingers to pull back. Imagine if your eye sees fire, but then is unable to talk to your hands to remove it. Your hand is just going to be there and it's just going to burn away. So the moment you see it, and the moment you get close enough to heat, you, your skin will send to your brain and say, ha, this thing is hot. You connect the nerves to pull back, right? Let me tell you how they communicate with one another. They use the same sequence that God uses to communicate to you and me in our subconscious mind. Why? Because, Chris, have you ever sat down one day and it's like, you tell your wife, hey, Kayla, keep quiet. My toes are talking to my ears. Wow. My nose is stuck into my belly, which I tell my wife all the time, hmm, I'm smelling this thing and my belly is hungry. You know, that is me imagining. But in reality, we don't hear that conversation. Why? Because it's happening at a subconscious level, but it does happen. Because there are no mag there's nothing magical about creation. Creation is very practical. And that's why when you throw up a stone, it falls back down. Many of us wish we could just drive our cars on empty. No, that's not how God works. If you need to, miraculously, that can happen. But God does not expect you to live by miracles. He expects you to live a blessed life. 
Miracles as desirable as they are, they can be inconvenient. But that's the world. The world is teaching us to live by miracles because most of us need other people for miracles and people like to be needed. So they would convince, convince you to live from one miracle to the other. I've been in cultures wherein a lot of pastors teach life by miracles. Oh, come next Sunday for the miracle for your finance. Come next Sunday for the miracle for your marriage. For crying out loud, you will not find in the Bible wherein God expects us to live by miracles. We're supposed to live by faith and faith is supposed to be a walk. Not an event, not an occasion. You understand what I'm saying? And so we need to understand that there are no magic processes. There are miracles, yes, but God expects you to live by wisdom, by knowledge, and by understanding. And so what I'm telling you is that your body actually talks one to another subconsciously. And if you have the word of God fully functioning within you, your system will not lack the vocabulary to be able to control and connect with one another. You try it. Keep studying the word regularly as you should. You will start to feel different kind of vitality in your system. Don't take my word for it. I beg you in Jesus' name. You go try it. What have you got to lose? So I want to encourage you today. Let us take those two things principally that I have said to you today by the Lord. Thing number one, God is offering us today the miracle of forgiveness. So that the things that we're not even aware of, that we're holding against ourselves, that we have since forgotten, that the Lord is going to allow for us to release ourselves in forgiveness so that there can be true restoration and realignment of our subconscious mind with our conscious mind. The Lord says that I need to give you one more example. You see, many of us, and I'm going to use an example that many of us can relate to. Many of us, when we were growing up, we were told, by the people that were struggling around us, that to make it, you have to have two or three jobs. You have heard people preach again and again this concept of multiple streams of income. Oh, you have to go do this, you have to go do that. And so that is what has already gone into your subconscious mind. Even though God has chosen to bless you through just that one thing that he put in your hand. The Bible says whatsoever your hand finds to do, do with all your heart. But your attention is divided because everybody's telling you you need multiple sources. Don't get me wrong. Let multiple sources of income not be a means. Let it be a blessing. You can receive multiple sources of income as a blessing. But if you tie your entire destiny to multiple sources of income, that is what you have already told your subconscious mind. And, your ex and now your consciousness is wondering why God is not blessing your Amazon business. Because your Amazon business is like, well, when we look down there, what we have been told is that we're not enough. You need six more of us. So I'm not going to drive myself crazy to prosper you. I'm waiting for the other six streams of income to be established. That is the conversation going on subconsciously and you don't know it. And the Lord is saying, I need you to let go of all that burden that you have placed upon yourself in your subconscious mind. The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will give to you the desires of your heart. So I want to encourage you today to recognize that deep within you, you may have taken on some notions like that and limited how God can bless you because of your lack of understanding. Let go and let God. So that is the kind of thing that the Lord is talking about today, that there can be double-mindedness, wherein in your mind, you're expecting to be promoted at work. In your mind, you're expecting that that one business that you're still trying to build works. But why is it not working? Because you're double-minded. Your subconscious mind has a slew of things that it's trying to fix that are not even broken because of what you told it. Forgive your inadequacy of the past. Let the Lord deal with that, but you follow me. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, but you Follow me. So thing number one is the Lord is restoring our subconscious mind. But thing number two is this. God says, I need you to be diligent. I need you to know the power of my word. I need you to pursue my word in righteousness. I need you to believe what I have said. I need you to reconstruct the path to your subconscious mind by daily meditating on the word of God. I'm not repeating that today because you can find messages that I have preached on meditation on YouTube, wherein I've spoken about how you can rewrite the code of your subconscious mind through the process of meditation. Meditation is what the modern day philosophers call the principle of auto-suggestion as championed by Napoleon Hill of blessed memory. But I tell you what, they are trying to rebrand 
find what is in the word of God. The word of God says meditate upon the word day and night that you may observe to do all. You see, all talks about the entire stack of your human existence. The stack, there are levels from the subconscious to the conscious. You need the word of God. Let's break bread before someone comes to pull me off of this stage. As we break bread today, I want you to say to yourself, if I forgive any, he shall be forgiven. She shall be forgiven. They shall be forgiven. And so I forgive, first of all, myself. I forgive myself deep within my subconscious. Lord, take all of the burdens that I have placed upon myself that I might be free indeed. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And Lord, in this liberty, wherein I have been set free, let me build myself up, praying in the Holy Ghost. Let me build myself up, studying your word. Let me build myself up, meditating upon your word, that I may see true healing come into my life, from my consciousness to my subconsciousness, that I may see true healing come into my life, from the vision of the future, through the desire of the present and the memory of the past. Let every dimension of me be fixed. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus. You may take off the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. Justin, thank you for letting me use you as an example. But the Lord said to me that there are many other people here today who attend to things when they become a need. So there is a way you approach God once there's a need. There is a way You bring out your devotion when there is a need. And that has worked so far, but it's not going to take you to the next level. The next level will require you, just like the word of the Lord came to Justin, to not wait until there is a need, to live every day as though you need an encounter with God. Let me say this again very slowly. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And do you know that faith is not then, faith is not later. The Bible says now, faith is. You need faith for now. And how does faith come? Kenyatta, faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. I've explained that to you multiple times, but for the sake of Chris, who wasn't here the day that I said it. You see, we need to know how to hear God because faith comes by hearing. But the hearing process itself, the ability to hear, comes by your familiarity with the Word of God. To hear that which is being said, you need to first of all know that which is being written. It is the order of things. Jesus' ministry, like I told you, began with it is written and then the written word through the word that became flesh became what the spoken word and so we need to know exactly how to live our lives which is every day get a word from God by the grace of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit it has become second nature to me to not pay too much attention to anything else around me until I have heard a word from God for the day have you ever seen me come here to preach or teach or even pray without saying what the Holy Spirit has, has just said to me that day. It is the way we are all supposed to live because I tell you as a word of reminder, darkness is coming upon the earth and grows darkness to people. Only the people that have already known how to engage the light of the word of God from the inside of them will see in the day of darkness. And so I want to encourage you. What are you waiting for? Exercise your authority and your privilege.
What authority am I talking about? The authority to bring your body under subjection and to shut out distractions so that you can be able to leverage the privilege that you have of having the Holy Spirit who can speak to you and release the life that is in the Word of God to you. But let me say this to you. If you have not been given to the study of the Word of God, give yourself like three months before you start enjoying it. Uh, nobody told me that. So when I started studying the Word of God, and after like two weeks, it wasn't getting any more fun. I dropped it and went to play soccer. And my brother saw me. He was like, this is about the time you study the word every day? I said, yeah, I gave up. I was about eight or nine years old. He said, what do you mean you gave up? I said, it wasn't making any sense. He says, let's try something else. He got me another translation of the Bible. I was reading the Barclays translation of the Bible. Can you even imagine? It was even more difficult than the King James. So he got me the living Bible. And that one was like, kind of like reading my storybooks from school. So kind of, I was able to kind of manage, but still nothing was hitting me. And so I gave it up again. And they told me, he says, you just have to keep on doing it. And so I kept on doing it. By the time I was 12, I would be at school and just start laughing amongst my mates because a scripture that I had read would just come up in my spirit and shower me with God's goodness. I will never forget. I will tell you this, about maybe two or three months after my brother told me to keep studying the word of God, I wasn't understanding what I was reading, but I was just doing it anyway. I was doing it anyway. It wasn't fun, but I was doing it. I was about nine years old or just turned 10. One boy in my class came into, into the classroom from recess and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, he needs me. I was like, me? He says, no, me, the Holy Spirit. So I went to him. I said, Opie. He said, yeah. I said, you need the Holy Spirit. I said, who is that? I said, I'm going to tell you about the Holy Spirit. And while I was yet speaking, he broke out speaking in tongues. And immediately I knew that God is rewarding my diligence. Let us rise up and close the service. I want to pray for you before you leave today. You know why? And I want you to pay attention to me. Let nobody leave the room. Just give me two more minutes of your time. Give it to the Lord. You see, the Lord said to me while I was sharing that story, that he's putting his angels in place because he has given to us so much treasure today. The Bible says the thief comes not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. You can't receive all of these treasurable secrets without the enemy getting interest in your case. And so I'm praying over you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that no evil eye will see you, neither will they see the purse that is holding the goodness of revelation that you have received. The birds of the sky will not be able to pick the seed of the word of God from your heart. Whatever part of your heart that was stony while the word of God was coming forth, let it become flesh right now in the mighty name of Jesus. According to the order of Ezekiel 36, 26, the Lord turns the heart of stone into flesh. Let every stony heart of rebellion, of resistance, of ignorance, and of bad culture, let it become flesh today so that that word of God can fall on the good soil of your heart to do you good so that two years from today, you are walking upon your high places so that a year from now, you're making in disciples of others in the study of the word and in the pursuit of the things of the kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus nobody here today under the sound of my voice will live here as a prey to Satan you will live here as a champion in the world in the mighty name of Jesus hey Lord I thank you because the gift of the hunger and the thirst of the kingdom is being dished out in here today let your angels have a free reign in here today given to each and everyone to all and sundry of the hunger and the thirst for the the righteousness of your kingdom so that we will not feel satisfied until we have studied your word so that we will not be satisfied until we have received a word from you that births faith in our hearts lord in the mighty name of jesus our yesterday has become the shadow today is the springboard tomorrow is the platform of glory and we will rule and reign with you in glory by wisdom by understanding and with lots and lots of grace and knowledge in the mighty name of jesus I want you to say this of yourself. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand ye therefore. Many of us put on the whole armor of God, but we're still sitting down. So tell yourself, arise, shine, for your light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Praise the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. I'm going to say this very quickly. I know the guys are up here. They're going to bless us with some music. If you're not in a hurry, if your child doesn't have to go to school at 2 a.m., I want to encourage you to spend two or three minutes. Sit down and just let that word soak. 
You see, you are filled to the brim. Walk very carefully so that you don't spill any of it. God bless you. Alan's going to come up to receive the offering and to take the announcements. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If my brother could help us with the uh, offering slide, please. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. We're not going to spend too much time here. Let's give God praise. Let's show him thanks in our offering, for we know the giving details are there. Father, we thank you for what you've done in this place. We thank you for your presence, oh God. Father, we ask of thee to be pleased in our giving. Lord, so much that you've given us tonight, so much that we can run with, oh God. Father, we thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you help us to receive the full import, oh God, of what you have given us this night. Father, we thank you for this power of deliverance, this mighty work of deliverance you work in us, oh God, day by day. Father, we thank you for the man and woman of God of this house, Lord, that you speak through to minister to us. Lord, let these offerings, let these tithes be pleasing in your sight tonight. For Lord, you know your children, you know their need before they even ask, oh God. And Father, we thank you that you bring us to higher heights in you. You take us to deeper depths in you, oh God. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. As we've been instructed here, the minstrels will be behind us playing, but let's take this time to really soak in his presence to let this get deep down in us. I pray that everyone have a blessed week. All right.